Reporting started. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Hager. I'm the Manager of Technical Assistance and Dissemination at the National Quality Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our February End Disparities Learning Exchange webinar, MSM of Color Health. We have a full agenda, and we have a number of presenters to help us um, through today's um, discussion and journey. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. One of the things we like to do just to get a sense of who is on the line is to uh, um, enter our name and a little bit about us in the chat room. So I will start Michael Hager, NQC, NY, NY, um, and disparities here. All right. Um, by entering this information, we can kind of recognize each other a little bit um, and see where we're calling from, um, and also just to kind of give us a little bit of a sense um, where everyone in line is kind of from, from a distribution sense, so that, um, you know, we have some idea for examples and um, solutions and challenges that, um, you know, are kind of experienced by folks in the room here. Just a couple of ground rules for participating. Uh, we encourage everyone to participate by writing your questions in the chat area during the presentations. Everyone's line is muted on entry, um, but you'll be able to unmute your line if you'd like to ask a question by pressing the orange button to the right of your name. Um, we ask that you uh, put yourself back on mute when you're done speaking, um, just in case there is any on hold music. And yes, that's the reason why we'd like you to avoid putting us on hold. I'm sure that whatever groovy tunes you have available for um, folks calling in um, is great for that purpose, but would be very disruptive for us today on our webinar if, if um, all of a sudden we were hearing, um, you know, some um, hit uh, music. So um, uh, we also um, wanted to let you know that we'll be sending an evaluation after this webinar. It'll come via email to everyone who um, has registered or attended according to our records. And of course, um, this call is being recorded so it can be saved on our website for future viewing um, and by sharing uh, with others who weren't able to join today's phone call. I see a whole bunch of folks entering their info in the chat room. Thank you very much for that. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Clemens Steinbach, our director, to provide some additional words of welcome. Clemens? Oh, thank you so much, Michael, and I wanted to not to take up too much time today because I think we have a full agenda and uh, a really a wonderful array of our guest speakers um, ready to go. I just wanted to thank all of you um, to participate today, and I think that we hope that through these calls to um, give you a little bit of ideas for what you can do at your local sites, and we encourage you um, to listen carefully and apply that to your sites. And, um, we are really encouraged about the number of individuals who have joined us so far in our webinars. And I want to thank the presenters for being here today. And also a big thanks to Michael for his leadership on the calls and for his, uh, um, and also in this case also for Julia to facilitate today's call. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Clemens. So um, just a little bit of context if this is your first activity with us. The End Disparities Learning Exchange is a nine-month initiative to promote the application of improvement interventions that will reduce HIV-related disparities in four key populations, all while building, sustaining a community of learners among Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients. Today's webinar on MSM of Color Health represents one of those four populations that we're focusing on. But of course, by focusing on one population, we're not going to lose sight of the fact that we are an incredibly diverse group of folks um, everywhere and that we all have several identities and the concept of intersectionality is very important. So you're going to be hearing things that aren't just strictly related to, um, oops, you're going to be hearing things that aren't just related to um, our, um, and Darren, I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to not do that. All right. Um, <clears throat> We're going to be speaking and focusing a lot on intersectionality um, as well. 
So uh, where does this fit in with the broader NQC um, suite of services and activities? Um, this is one of our communities of learning, um, and it is natural, uh, national in nature. We have uh, regional groups and um, collaboratives as well that kind of focus on individual regions. Um, but then, of course, we have our on-site face-to-face consulting, um, and we have a number of different multi-day trainings that we offer to folks, in addition to an enormous array of resources available for free online, um, in paper and electronic. So um, in case you aren't familiar with NQC, um, we offer everything from very passive um, resource um, um, a repository all the way up to very intensive, um, you know, face-to-face -face work on your clinical quality management at your home agency. So our agenda for today, uh, we are almost completed with our welcome and introductions, um, and I will get out of the way to um, welcome Julia Schluter um, and our wonderful presenters who will walk us through MSM of Color Voices in Healthcare. Um, we're going to talk about um, stuff that's coming out the research pipeline in addition to um, other strategies um, that you have found helpful in your own work uh, with MSM of Color, um, and hopefully we are going to have a great dialogue uh, sharing lots of resources from many corners of our country um, that will affect many types of MSM of color. So some learning objectives for you. We'd like you to name three key barriers for MSM of color to achieve optimal health outcomes. We'd like you to discuss issues pertinent to the intersection of identities for race, gender, sexual orientation, and age. And we'd like you to describe one education strategy that will help providers uh, provide the best HIV care for MSM of color, and that could be something that is education that providers, um, you know, have with patients, or something that we can do to train our providers to more effectively engage MSM of color um, in our healthcare. So, without further ado and a little bit of a head uh, schedule, I'm going to turn it over to Julia Schluter, who is one of our NQC consultants. In addition to working with NQC for a number of years, um, um, both as a formal partner and um, informally behind the scenes, Julia is the director of Project ARC, which is a um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Julia. It is a patient navigation and um, um, yeah, linkage uh, system for um, women, infants, um, and children um, in a Part D program at the Washington University of St. Louis. Uh, Julia, take it away. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for everyone for joining us today. I um, have the pleasure of introducing everyone to two of the Learning Exchange spokespersons, and the first person we're going to hear from is Amir Simon. And Currently, a student who's studying human services as well as behavioral. Uh, he's also a behavioral health specialist, and <clears throat> for as long as Amir can remember, he um, has wanted to help people in a way that any way that he could. And he's always been a fighter for equal rights as well as an activist. After he was diagnosed with HIV four years ago, Amir uh, was given a new outlook on life, um, along with a deeper love and compassion for advocating for what he feels is right. And I'm. So happy to have him on the call today. Um, our second spokesperson that we'll hear from is Joey Pons. And Joey began his activism in New York City in 1987 with ACT UP. And that was also the same year he was diagnosed with HIV. He is the co-founder of the organization Queer Nation. And he has served as the president of the National Latino Lesbian and Gay Organization. Um, his career as an activist for the LGBT community is evidenced by serving on so many uh, directors, and which includes 23 organizations. So Joey is really um, a true person in the community and, and doing the work that he is very passionate about. He is um, a leader in the LGBT community um, who was invited to the White House twice during the presidency of Bill Clinton. And currently in Puerto Rico, he's the co-founder of the PR Community Network for the Clinical Research on AIDS the Savannah AIDS Civil Rights Litigation Project, Community Initiative, and the Foundation Article 2. So Joey is really um, quite a distinguished uh, and respected lobbyist, and we are so glad to also have him on the call today to be able to share his perspective. And I just uh, welcome both of them. And Amir, um, please go ahead and, and join the call. Say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, so I guess we're going to jump right into it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yes, sir. Community needs, cultural and social pressure of acceptance, um, access access to adequate and affordable care, more diversity with healthcare providers, improvement of effective communication skills and educational attainment. These were some of the uh, more apparent needs that I've collected from, you know, just interviewing with different members of the community, some providers and case managers that work with MSM of color. Thank you, Amir. Amir, could you tell us a little bit more kind of about your story and and about uh, maybe some things that we're going to hear about the Partners in Care call that's coming up? Um, well, I've been an activist for like maybe four years. Um, I've just really been, you know, really active since I was diagnosed. And I've just noticed that there aren't, it isn't enough people you know, fighting and advocating for MSN of color and just, you know, trying to do what's right. And I mean, you're based in Philadelphia, right? Is there anything yeah. in particular that you've noticed in Philadelphia in terms of disparities or in terms of um, unmet need or in terms of different approaches that providers can take um, in an environment like Philadelphia um, to help um, engage MSM of color in um, care programs? Well, one of the main issues that a lot of people have been, you know, telling me was the access to adequate and affordable care. Um, so, for example, when they call to schedule an appointment, their appointment may be months away or, you know, just inconvenient and it, they aren't able to get the meds, you know, get their labs drawn and things like that. Okay. And of course, the diversity with some of the healthcare providers. Um, some individuals feel as though they can't really discuss certain topics out of fear of being, you know, misunderstood or judged or just, you know, not understood. Yeah, and I think that that's an important point there. Um, so in your experience, is this something that is addressed by making sure that we develop more um, clinicians who are people of color, um, or does it have to do with, you know, the intersection of MSM and, and race? Um, is this something that we could potentially provide additional cultural competency training to providers that we already have? What solutions do you think would be, you know, the best approach um, forward um, based on your experience and, and, you know, your knowledge of the community there in Philly? Um, I would definitely say more training is definitely needed. Um, Okay. Yeah. I've also noticed uh, that we have a, a question from Robert in the chat room, and he's asking, uh, Amir, if you could clarify if you feel like the misunderstanding is race or sexual orientation or both? Both. Okay. So maybe maybe what we can do is um, is uh, you know hear a little bit from Joey and kind of like think a little bit um, you know get some other voices from different parts of the country involved with these presentations and then we can kind of circle back and um, maybe have a facilitated discussion with all of our panelists. So Michael, I think that sounds like a great idea. Our next. Um, spokesperson is Joey Pons, and as I said, Joey's been an advocate and an activist in the LGBT community and um, 
working as a lobbyist for a long time for HIV. Uh, Joey, please share, and it's nice to hear you. Likewise. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is well and excited about this project. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I was lucky enough to go to school in New York when I was 17. I'm originally from Port, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And uh, I got to New York in 1987, the same year that I got infected with HIV. And um, I was like a kid in a candy store with so many beautiful men. And I was a young kid, really. I wasn't even an adult yet at 17. Um, but then I had a lot of friends from Puerto Rico who also went to school and colleges in New York. And uh, so we had a group of Puerto Rican friends of about 30 somewhat um, Puerto Rican friends that we knew each other from high school in Puerto Rico that were going to school in, in different colleges in New York. And uh, so the crisis really it started hitting us really hard when some of the people of our inner circle um, started dying. and. Uh, Therefore, it was really um, a time of, of great de emotional despair, um, at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, particularly in the late 80s, um, with the amount of deaths um, every day, basically. And that um, started my activism. Um, I, I think I started my activism when I came out of the closet at the age of 15 in an all-boys Catholic school, um, because that was an act of activism. <laughs> Um, so, but then again, in New York, I got involved with uh, the Eighth Coalition to Unleash Power Act Up, which was a direct action group uh, that addressed all the lack of services that were being provided by different government agencies from the federal to state level and city level in New York. And uh, that was a great learning experience for me. Um, and from that, I went on to other organizations such as Queer Nation, which was another direct action group um, that dealt specifically with gay and lesbian rights, um, not HIV. However, I have been involved in HIV all my life um, as I have served on numerous boards of directors of um, community organizations and nonprofits. Um, I was also privileged enough to be the chairman of the National Latino Lesbian and Gay Organization, which had a name that did not include the word AIDS in it, but we did do provide services um, for AIDS uh, patients and, and HIV testing on numerous uh, facilities that we had throughout the United States um, on many cities such as San Francisco, San Antonio, Dallas, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, uh, New York, Miami, et cetera. Um, so basically, um, I have been heavily involved with HIV all my life, particularly on the personal level, taking care of myself, but also taking care of other people that I come across. Um, and in my job right now, I am community liaison for the Ryan White ADAP uh, program of the Puerto Rico Health Department, which gives me the opportunity to see patients almost on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, this morning, I was giving a conference on the other side of the island to 19 patients um, about quality of life and adherence to care. And that leads me to the point of disparities in, um, in health disparities and service disparities. Um, a lot of the lack of adherence to care or to medications or both um, are related to many social determinants um, that are affected by race, class, background, education. And I see that here in Puerto Rico, and I, I'm, I, and I'm, I have seen it in places I have visited in the United States recently, that happens also with the Latino and black communities of people affected with HIV. Um, and here in Puerto Rico, I see it on a daily basis. Partic it is more pronounced um, when there are private entities involved in the care of a patient. And uh, as, as we all know and are familiar with how Ryan White and the ADAP works, um, we have a lot of patients that are not uh, receiving services directly from Ryan White funded organizations, but they do get their medications through ADAP, through the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. And perhaps they, they get it at an organization that it's not a public organization. 
And uh, that's where we see most of the disparities and the way that people are treated. If they're black, if they're, um, if they, if they don't have a good education, if they don't come from a social economic background um, that is acceptable, as some may say, uh, they're treated very differently. And uh, that results or could result in losing people to care uh, because the people feel bad, they feel discriminated against, discriminated against um, and they might not come back the next time they have an appointment. Um, also, another issue that affects heavily um, the minority communities, the, the, pe the pe people, gay, gay men of color, um, is the access to education. And I think that that's one of the main reasons why there's a lot of people that it starts from getting the tests done. A lot of the young kids, for example, uh, young MSM, are not being tested. Uh, and they, what they have in mind is, oh, if I get it, there's medication for it, and I can live forever. Um, and the, and the, they engage in careless sexual activity um, frequently, and uh, I'm sure we see that everywhere in the U.S. as well within minority communities. This, the, the use of recreational drugs such as crystal meth has become more and more popular amongst young kids. It used to be popular among older gay men, but now it's being used by young kids, teenagers, um, and that leads to, engage, in, to engaging in unsafe sex activities uh, with people who are positive and people who are not, and everybody gets infected. Um, so I think that the lack of education um, is one of the key factors because they don't have the same access uh, that white guys do. Um, not all of them have access to the internet, for example, because a lot of these people are from impoverished communities, um, so they don't have access to the information, they don't have access to a computer. Um, they don't, they, many of them they don't have access to, uh, to a cell phone so they can search the internet and get information uh, of where to get care. Um, and uh, I think that that also um, contributes to the disparities um, of these people not getting the care they need. So Joey, I had a, this is, this is all really interesting and I, I hear several, you know, themes emerging from um, your conversation that matches up with um, some of the themes that Amir had mentioned, you know, speaking about stigma and discrimination, education around, um, you know, substances, around sexuality, around HIV, um, you know, that, that's, um, you know, great. And I'm thinking about, you know, when, when, we, when we think about peers and peers being people who, you know, are, the same or very similar to us. Uh, not just one identity, but like a number of identities. We, we have a question from um, the chat room um, that came to me privately. It says, um, no offense is intended. This presentation is wonderful. Um, your picture looks Caucasian, and I wonder that um, while you are Puerto Rican and Latino, um, have you ever um, had issues with that perception in terms of um, needing to find energy um, to be um, acknowledged as a man of color as you see culturally literate health care. Um, and I think that an extension to that question would be, you know, when you go and interact with, um, um, you know, Latinos of African descent um, in Puerto Rico, is there a gap there in terms of your ability to engage with and interact with them? Okay. Um, there's two, two, two separate answers. Yeah. The, the first one, yes, I am white. My my parents, both of my parents' families are white, um, half from the United States of Scottish descent, and the other half extremely white from Spain. Uh, but I was born in Puerto Rico, and so were my parents. Mm -hmm. However, the, I did, the, the, my, my physical appearance did affect me in the United States when I was uh, president of the National Latino Lesbian Gay Organization, uh, most people that were involved with the National Latino Lesbian Gay Organization, including our staff, despised me because of I didn't look because I didn't look Latino, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and they didn't feel represented by me. 
So that was a challenge. Um, I, I dealt with that challenge at the time by getting involved with other organizations on, on a national level um, and getting a seat at the table. And that way I demonstrated to them that I was able to get Latinos to the table of the Human Rights Campaign Fund, for example, uh, of the Victory Fund, of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, which were very white organizations um, yeah. during, the, during the 90s. Um, and, I, and I achieved that, and that sort of, I gained the respect of some, let's just say. Um, on the other question, which can you remind me quickly? Um, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, what, what I do when I go to see patients um, and give them talks and uh, workshops on adherence to care, which is the, mo the one that I most do because people like it a lot, it's very interactive, and they gain a lot of information that change their lives, and they start taking their medications regularly um, after taking that workshop with me. Um, and I identify immediately as a gay man living with HIV for 30 years. And that automatically breaks down whatever barrier they have because I'm too white. Mm -hmm. Because they immediately identify with me as another HIV positive person. And it, that has worked for me. This is all so interesting and important. You know, you know, as I mentioned before, we're thinking about, you know, um, today we're talking about MSM of color health, but last month we talked about transgender health, and next month we're talking about African-American Latina women. And the intersectionality of these, you know, and identities and what it means to, you know, um, I guess be able to connect with people on that way, um, be um, accepted as a peer, to be, you know, given that, I guess, like, support or trust as a peer, you know, that kind of is the first piece you're talking about, you know, and the second piece you're talking about is more kind of like about like, you know, um, some of the lived experience and that the lived experience that you have with other people and shared lived experience may be very different on the global scale, but you're talking right now, if you make it very clear that I'm here to talk to you about your HIV and your HIV status and we share this lived experience in common, you know, to a certain extent, that that is a very good way to kind of overcome some of those barriers that, you know, um, on the, literally on the surface might end up like causing some challenges in terms of interacting with people. Would you say that that's accurate? And, and, and if so, like, what are some of the suggestions that you might have in terms of helping others to think this through in terms of, you know, that process of identifying peers and representatives and, and that level of comfort and trust building? Well, I think that it is important to have HIV positive people uh, involved in these um, interventions. Um, I, I also think it's very important to have HIV positive people on staff that can do these interventions because it is the best way for people to identify with the speaker and be open about their preoccupations and their problems and their personal situations that might be interfering in their um, adherence to care and medications. Um, and one of the things I do when I talk to people in, in and I'm at podium, I don't like podiums because I, I would want to be close to the people. So I always step down and I walk around the room. Um, and I touch people on the shoulder when I'm asking a question. Um, and that, that really helps um, the exchange. Um, another thing is that I always use we. I never use people with HIV. Uh, I use us living with HIV. Um, and that also helps a lot because um, I include myself in everything I say. And like when I outline the different things that interfere with adherence to medication, I say, because when I do this, when I do this, when I do that, I don't take, I'm not taking my medication because of this. So I use myself as an, as an example. Mm -hmm. And that's really helpful. Great. And that's, that is a recommendation I give to everyone because it works fabulously. Thank you. You know, I think uh, kind of along those lines, there was another question that was asked about the delivery of information as well as seeking um, healthcare information. And the, you know, so they've, they've asked both Joey and Amir, um, where and when do individuals from the black MSM or Latino MSM communities receive their 
sexual health information um, and what is the kind of the best or ideal method for receiving this information and who should be the person to deliver that information? Should it be the providers, consumers, together? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a, it, it has to be an interdisciplinary effort. I think that it should be uh, both providers uh, as well as peers from different levels. One thing about disseminating information that is really important is we have to know who is the population that we're providing the information to because the way that the information is put together may work for some com uh, communities and not for others in, in terms of the language. Um, so if we're talking to people who are in like, let, let me take the example of Hispanic. Um, I lived in Boston for many years um, in Villa Victoria, which is a Puerto Rican neighborhood, um, of, and, and it's all public housing. So th these are people whose income is very low, and their education level is also very low. So if you're going to go there, you need to speak to them in a language that they can understand and relate to. Mm. So not all, not, not all the information is going to get through if you keep the same thing to all the different groups. Did I, did I, did I make myself clear? Yes. Yeah, that was great. Okay. Thank you. Amir, what are your thoughts about the delivery of information and especially for the black MSM community and, you know, what, what does that look like and who should deliver it? And, you know, are there any differences between um, kind of Joey's thoughts and your thoughts? Um, well, to piggyback off of what, a, what Joey said, I would definitely say both providers and consumers should be delivering those, you know, messages and different forms of prevention because it makes them, it makes everyone seem, you know, as one and re relatable. Thank you, and thank you everyone for, uh, you know, asking questions and please continue to do so. We'll continue to monitor the chat room. Um, right now we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to our next speaker who is Nathaniel Henley, and he has been part of the uh, Persons Living with HIV AIDS community for nearly 35 years now. He uh, has a, his history and illness go back to when the disease was identified as GRID. After being diagnosed with full-blown AIDS, uh, 20 years of active substance abuse and experiencing homelessness, he uh, today is a shining example of survival and hope. He is currently undetectable and has 15 years of recovery. He's working as a professional in the Florida Department of Health, uh, where apparently it's very cold today, a whopping 65 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also a very proud homeowner. Um, Nathaniel is a long-term survivor and has lived through the epidemic during a time when the disease was barely known to the community. And he began his journey in an era when medications and treatments and services weren't readily available. So in short, he, uh, he and much of society were led to believe that he was in the last stages of life with no real hope for the future. Um, however, uh, today we look at Nathaniel's life and see that he has um, been part of the quality, he's the quality improvement manager for the disease control programs within the Florida Department of Health. And he has um, just a lot of different uh, experiences to share with us um, and talk about in terms of, of his journey. So Nathaniel, welcome. Well, thank you, Julie and Michael, for inviting me to this um, webinar. I'm very excited about sharing my experience in my life, um, ups and downs that I have here. I have a lot of them. Um, I consider myself as a, um, a star child because I contracted this disease in the early 80s. And um, just like Julie just mentioned, it wasn't any it wasn't any cures around. It wasn't nothing. It wasn't no medicine. We didn't have a national quality center. It, none of this this even existed. So, you know, I've seen all of this. I saw Brock Hudson die, and while I sat in my room and looked and wondered, when will I start the body sweats? When will I see the night chills? 
when will I start losing weight? But it never happened. Um, I got on medicine late. I did wind up with HIV. I mean, not HIV, but full-blown AIDS, and that's what it's diagnosed today. But due to these medicines, my viral load is undetectable, which is good. But I'm my age, I'm 60 years plus, years old. So I have seen a lot, and I went through a lot. Some of the pertinent issues that I had then, which is I, I want to point these out and, 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 and um, clarify them, were the issues being with substance abuse, housing, and transportation. But I did have a support group. I had family and friends, and edu I was well educated, and I was always working. I started off with the city of Jacksonville, and um, I, eventually I went into the military and the Air Force, and I left there and came back and went and started working for Barnett Banks. I also have worked for the state. This is my second time around with the state. And um, I also worked for Lockheed Martin. But during all of those professional jobs that I had, except for the Air Force, I was on drugs. I was a functional addict. And I lived for uh, 20 years on substance abuse, hard crack cocaine. And I saw my life dwindle down to nothing. Um, to homelessness, you know, where I was basically eating out of the garbage cans. And a lot of our MSM do, are doing that today. They're, they're, I've seen them, they're being educated, they're, they are educated, but then they wind up in the same peril that I went through. D due to rejection, discrimination, and racism plays a lot in that, and I saw that I have seen it so much. Matter of fact, I went to a, um, a class about discrimination last night. And I went over some of the same things, and I tried to point out to them that, you know, we're all people. And at the end of the day, who want to give up their rights? Who want to give up their privileges? Nobody. But we have to level the playing fields if we want to be sincere about this epidemic. And a lot of people all over this country now are talking about getting to zero. Well, I don't see us getting to zero until we learn how to live together. I've seen these agencies, when I came into this um, epidemic, a lot of these agencies didn't even exist. I've seen some of them grow and become lucrative, and it's a business for them now. Where before, it was, you know, they were struggling, they were helping their friends and their brothers, but they moved on. I've seen case managers who didn't care. I worked in just about every agency in, in Jacksonville. I don't want to call their names, but I work for all of them. And right now, I'm still in I'm case management with an agency because I still have these barriers of um, transportation, economics, and finance. And then the final one is exception from providers. You know, I, right now I'm with the state of Florida, and we get our um, contract is through CBS Pharmacy. Well, ironically, CBS Pharmacy also has the Ryan White contract. Now, I'm trying to, I keep bringing this up because I am the co-chair to the Jacksonville Area Ryan White Planning Council. How did a major company get two major contracts from the state? To me, that's collusion. But don't nobody seem to to say anything about it, or it just goes over people's head. Those are some of the things that we are, we are facing in the, the, today and that I see that's going to hinder us from getting to zero. Because this is not a business. It, it started off with people were scared and they was dying and they, was in, they were in hotels, they was in hospitals, they was in alleys, and they were supporting, they was even in houses, and they were supporting and helping each other. Now, if you don't have any money, then you can't get anything. My co-pays at CBS Pharmacy are $120. My actual payments of my medicine is $3,000 plus dollars a month. When If I can't pay my co-pays, they won't deliver my medicine. So they rather, they rather lose $3,000 than to send me my medicine and, I, and, and lose $120. It's crazy. Those are the disparities, those are the discrepancies that I see. In spite of all of the, the, the racism, the discrimination, the lack of education for some of our young people and access to information, I think um, one of the presenters, um, Joey, spoke about the access to information. I, I see it every day. People come in here, they can't even apply for a job because they don't have any access to information. And the way our new administration is going, they're not going to have access to a whole lot of other things by the end of the, next year this time. 
the, the, the final thing that I see as far as discrepancies are um, barriers to care is acceptance from providers. I've, a, I've seen it just about and went to every infectious disease doctor in Jacksonville. I can call some of them as even fast. Matter of fact, the doctor who diagnosed me, he's dead. But um, most of these doctors now that I go to, they don't want to talk to you. They don't want to share information with you. They want to rush you in. It's like a business to them. They rush in and rush out. But I selected because I have the opportunity to do that. I have the luxury to do that. I can select and um, basically interview my doctor before I accept care from them. And I think a lot of people don't have that option to do that. Um, the, doc the doctors today, most of them I go to, like I go to different doctors for different things, eye doctors, I go to the dental, I go to dermatologists, I see my primary care, and I learned that a lot of them, they, they will talk to you, but they won't speak with you. Now, the doctor that I have for, for my infectious disease doctor, he actually works here in the health department, but I see him on a private, professional basis, and he stops me in the hallway and he talks to me. But everybody's not privileged to have that type of doctor or have that type of care because some of these people, they're homeless, they're still on drugs, are they in bad relationships, are they are, you know, basically selling their body for a living. I look on some of these adult sites and I see these people on there because we do search because I work in disease control and some of these same people are on sites and they are not identifying who they are, what they are, what they have. And that's bad. That's very bad. But in summary, my health is catching up with me. You know, it, it says 35 years, but it's uh, probably close to 40 years that I've been living with this disease. And the many barriers and disparities, disparities make it harder for me to continue optimum health care. Um, the financial struggles that I face are mere fractions of what other Blacks or other MSMs are facing today. I still find myself seeking financial, mental, and social support. You know, I, I can't, I can, I, today I went, um, I had a, a, a positive group that met with me, and they are our quality client circle. And it's five of them, and they represent all of our services here in the county health department. And I sit back and I listen to them and I look at them and I analyze them. These are people, these are human beings, both black, both white, MSMs. And it's, it's discouraging and heartening to me to see the same stuff that I saw nearly 40 years ago still going on today. We need to come together as a community. We need to help each other because we're not going to get to zero doing the same thing that we're doing. You know, I commend the National Quality Health Center for what they are doing, trying to enlighten our communities and bring some type of awareness to some of the disparities and, and problems and barriers that our communities are facing. But it's going to take the whole community. I mean, everybody. It's going to take the doctor who don't want to touch you. I've seen people here in the health department use different bathrooms. They, a lot of them don't know I'm HIV positive, and some of them do know I'm HIV positive. They will actually use the bathrooms that are, are not for the public, or where the public frequent. They won't go to those bathrooms. They'll come upstairs where I'm at to use the bathroom, and they're on the floor where the patients are at. How crazy is that? Yeah. You can't catch HIV from the toilet stool. Nathaniel, thank you so much for sharing this with us. You know, and um, I'm looking in the chat room. Um, some of the things came to me um, just, you know, privately, um, but folks mm -hmm. are just giving you rounds of applause for your um, for your story and for for sharing this perspective that's so, you know, it's so real. You know, and uh, the, uh, just a couple of things that I want to um, pick up on here. That one. You know, you're continuing to tell the same story that, you know, our other um, brothers have said so far on today's call, but also echoing what folks had said last month on the transgender call, stigma, discrimination, racism, access to education, access to practical, affordable services um, that are, you know, timely, you know, and, and available. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think that another thing that you mentioned um, that the other gentleman didn't mention earlier, but, you know, that certainly we heard from Tio and Cecilia last month was um, thinking about the transparency 
um, that the uh, medical establishment kind of owes its patients in terms of, you know, this is what we're about, this is our values, these are our missions, this is how we want to help you, and, you know, and showing all along this is how we are helping you with data. Without transparency, it creates that, you know, um, room for suspicion. And on top of that, the discrimination that you already see, you know, just, um, you know, sexuality aside, racism aside, just related to HIV with, you know, it's 2017 and people using, you know, bathrooms on different floors. You know, folks on the line, I participated in a call um, yesterday, Emily and I did, um, with um, some um, rural AETC folks from around the country. This is still a problem. It's 2017. And the fact that there are hospitals in West Virginia or Wyoming or different places that will wash an entire bed with alcohol when someone leaves, really? Mm -hmm. Right. Really? So, you know, these are some of the things. What we're doing here today is building a discussion. We're giving you a lot of food for thought so we can really open up the floor soon to think about what we can do all together. We're hearing things that have worked well, things that have not worked as well, things that we did really well in the past that have kind of fallen away. You know, and I, I just want us to continue thinking about this and chewing on it as we move forward. Um, you know, I don't know, Julia, if we have time for any questions or if we should um, speak with Brandy now or, or what your thought is on that, but I'm sorry to jump in. I just wanted to share and say thank you, too. As another person living with HIV, um, thank you for your story, Nathaniel. Thank yeah, you Yeah, and I, I just want to echo Michael's sentiments and say thank you. And uh, thank you, Michael, for doing such a lovely recap because that's exactly where I was going with these these pieces that continue to link together through, that are highlighted through different spokespersons' experiences, but there, there's just these really common themes um, that, you know, to me, just highlight why it's important to, for us to get together and to have these discussions and to really think about uh, what we can do to, to change and work on um, these social determinants of health. You know, there is one question I think I would like to go ahead and ask Nathaniel before we, we jump to Brandy. And, and it's, you know, in large part also I think it would be helpful because you've had experience in working in the government, Nathaniel. And, um, you know, the one question that we have here that I'd just like to get your feedback on is you know, this person um, asks, they say, my experiment, excuse me, experience as a government employee is that we are horribly restricted in social marketing, uh, culturally reflective material for gay men due to heterosexism, homophobia, and fear of offending, in quotes, Mrs. Smith, a voter. <laughs> so uh, this, this person asks, you know, what can be done to defend appropriate public health tenants that reflect a gay men's reality in terms of public health messaging? Great question. Well, uh, that is an issue because it's, it's a much, much issue with us. Um, I would suggest to them to, if they have a local planning council, you got to, this is, this is why I sit on the planning council, the Jacksonville area around White Planning Council. We get about $20 million that come in and I get the chance to orchestrate that money, tell who's going to use it, how it's going to be used. You hit them with, hit them in there with their pocket. Hit them where, hit them where it hurts. If you want change, most of the people in our society don't recognize anything but money value anyway. If I put a dollar bill, if I put a twenty dollar bill on the screen and say if the next ten people call me, I get all types of calls about the twenty dollars that they're trying to get. So we have to go where they're at in this in this economic upheaval. Hit them where their money is. Join the planning council. You know, make your voice there. We we are limited with the health department as how we can um, use social media. How we can interact with, how can we, what we can publicize, what we can put out there, you know, it has to be curtailed. It, it, and a lot of that is true and it is needed. But um, in the end, you got to think about the people we lives we're trying to save. And people like they come from different backgrounds, different walks, different diversities, different cultures. So we need to, as a community, be very mindful of that as well. You know, I'm thinking, um, Joey, um, you know, you have experience working with um, government in many different capacities, too. Uh, you know, um, anything from your end, like how would you answer that question? And, you know, Amir, afterwards, also feel free to chime in. Can you rephrase it for me, please? Yes. Um, sorry about that. Scroll back up. Oh, 
right. It says, my experience as a government employee is that we are horribly restricted in social marketing, culturally reflective material for gay men due to heterosexism and homophobia and fear of offending Mrs. Smith, a voter. Uh, what can be done to defend appropriate public health tenants that reflect gay men's reality and public health messaging? I, I agree with that, and that happens all over. It happens here too in Puerto Rico, however, it varies from, from administration to administration, meaning on a state level. Um, obviously on a federal level, uh, we have yet to find out what um, the ogre of president that we got is gonna do. But um, I think that in terms of local health departments or state health departments, um, yes, that is definitely um, a barrier. Um, but again, it depends, I think, at least here in Puerto Rico, as well as in Massachusetts, where I lived for 20 years, not for 10 years, um, it varied with it, if it was Republicans or Democrats. So whoever is in the, the state house. Exactly. And uh, even some Democrats are very conservative, particularly on the Belt Bible states. Um, and uh, so, that is, is definitely a barrier. Here in Puerto Rico, we have the experience of having this last administration, not the one that just started in January, um, to do a lot of uh, social media, media stuff uh, in terms of prevention um, and, uh, and promoting that people get tested on all the sex, the sex and dating apps for MSL. Um, it, we're still doing it. I don't know how much longer we're going we're gonna to do it, depending on how this new Secretary of Health, um, who is from a right-wing leaning party, um, will ask for that to be right. changed, or, or hopefully, hopefully he won't say anything, <laughs> and we'll keep doing it. Thank you. I don't know, Amir, if you had anything to add relating uh, to that um, really great question or. I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Yes. Um, you know, what do we do basically, what do we do basically um, to make sure that gay men's um, uh, views and reality is reflected in public health messaging, considering that, you know, um, we are in an interesting time, and sometimes um, the folks who um, are in char or charged with approving our messages might say, you can't say that because it might offend someone. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say by having more diverse providers <clears throat> delivering those messages, mm -hmm. you know, to give a, a better outlook or you know, make it more relatable. Okay, so do what you can within the system that won't yeah. bump up into the big red buzzers, but instead make sure that you can be, you know, as open and welcoming and inviting as you can with your messaging, you know, um, and, you know, if you're not allowed to be affirming, then, you know, sadly don't be affirming, but do everything else that you can that won't hit the big red buzzer. Yeah. Great advice. So um, let's see, I have a question in um, the chat room um, from Dolores. Um, does anyone know of any media campaigns that are targeted to address this specific issue? Um, you know, and I'm thinking about um, one that comes to mind is the roots of health inequity. Um, this is something um, that um, the National Association of City and County Health Officials put together with our friends at the HIV AIDS Bureau. Um, and you can find out more, rootsofhealthinequity.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the chat room. I think this is a really great um, multi-session series that's open for health center staff, but also um, since it's created by Nacho, if you do work within a state or within a city health department, you can also um, you know, kind of sign up to be part of this series and um, it's really, really, really engaging. Um, 
in particular, it looks at social determinants of health that creates a situation that we see today in terms of outcomes that show massive disparities that is rooted in racism, heterosexism, misogyny, and a lot of the things that are kind of a little uncomfortable to talk about. But as we all know, in order to move forward and to end disparities, we have to get uncomfortable. And we have to be you know, willing to sometimes hit, accidentally hit those buzzers and then you know, have the wherewithal to know what to do next. Okay, fine, that's not gonna work. I can't do my gold standard, I'm gonna do my silver standard then. You know, and so on and so forth. I highly recommend that we take a look at the um, um, roots of health inequity, and I'll write that in the chat room now. Well, thank you, Michael. And uh, we're, I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker today, and that's uh, Brandy Oser. And Brandy is uh, with UCLA, and she started her career in the field of substance abuse and addiction in 1997. Currently, she is the project director of the SAMHSA-funded project, Young Men Who Have Sex With Men, and the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Center of Excellence at UCLA. Uh, she has been with this integrated substance abuse program since 2004 and previously worked on evaluation training and technical assistance for substance abuse services activities within the healthcare systems project. Um, she has experience in project management and monitoring clinical trials, data collection, analysis, and we're so excited to have her on the call today for her to share um, information about her Young Men Who Have Sex With Men project as well as the LGBT uh, co for the Center of Excellence. So welcome, Brandy. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you everyone, um, A, for having me on the call and just glad to hear everyone's stories and all the folks engaged and joining us today. Um, I'm here just to share, it's a little bit different than the rest. I, our group and the project that I'm lucky to be a part of, we really are a resource for providers. So those of you on the call, um, you know, I've heard a theme throughout the past previous speakers is the need for trainings for healthcare providers. Um, and that is what we do, and that's what we have actually developed um, over the past two years of our project. Um, so I'll just do a quick little background and explain what we have, and then um, just share a few just highlights of some of the work I've been fortunate enough to do on this journey. Um, so as Julie mentioned, we got funded by SAMHSA two years ago, and Really the whole point of the project was to help providers develop skills to develop um, more culturally responsive treatment for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender patients dealing with substance abuse, mental health disorders. Um, also though we have a very uh, a separate standalone training for YMSM, so we do have, it is focused more on young men of sex with men, um, but I believe the materials are applicable to all age groups. Um, so <clears throat> we were fortunate enough to have a, an advisory board and an amazing group of people that spent a lot of work in coming up with this training. And um, the real take home message of the training that we do is helping providers to provide affirming care to our patients so that when they come through the door, they feel welcome and then they'll come back. Um, and a lot of it really is about being aware of the stigma and the unconscious bias that we all hold, and especially in a society that's heterosexist. Um, and really the helping providers see that, you know what, you decide the code of ethics to provide care to anyone who comes through your door. So the stigma, the way you're treating patients is unacceptable. And I mean, they don't make people feel bad in that respect, but that is really like the tenet of the day-long um, training that we have. And we've been fortunate enough, um, basically the first year of our grant, we developed the materials, the curriculum, so we have two. One is just for the LGBT population, and then we have a, a separate standalone YMSM curriculum training. Um, and then in year two, we just finished, we, we've trained about 80 um, trainers across the country who now can deliver this training. So we have people all over the country. Um, we made sure we have um, a diverse group of trainers. So when folks come to our trainee, trainer, they see someone from the community um, actually delivering the message, and which actually aid, helps in the power of the material that we're providing. Um, we also, though, and so this now this last year is actually 
getting the training out there. So it's a free training. If anyone knows of an agency that needs it or if you're interested, um, I'm, I'm, at the end I'm sure we'll be able to share our, our website. Um, you can contact me and we just want to get the word out and get these trainings out and delivered um, so that people when they come to get help, get help that is affirming and help them meet, where, meet them where they are. Um, we also, though, not just our trainings, but we also have a website um, that has resources, articles, all kinds of things. Um, and another neat thing that we do is we hold monthly webinars. Um, and they're usually the fourth Friday of the month, there ha but there have been times where we've had to change the date for whatever reason. Um, but for instance, back a month or so ago, a couple months ago, actually, we had one specific to um, YMSM. And it was a fantastic webinar. Um, we actually had a panel of young men who really talked about their personal experiences and contextualized the data, but in their own words and what it meant to them and highlights and, and sorry, personal like insights on why they're at increased risk for HIV right now and like what, you know, we basically shared all this data and said, what does this mean to you and how can we fix this problem? Um, so, and that's actually on our website as well. So we have the webinars recorded and available. Um, so really we're just trying to increase the knowledge and change the attitudes and help people, um, providers. And it's not just mental health and substance use, really HIV. We have cover, um, government employees, primary care providers, public health practitioners, prevention. You know, we've done the training in all kinds of places, substance use counselors. Um, so it's not our, but what's nice about our curriculum, it's not specific to a certain, you know, type of provider. I think it's a message for anyone, really. And even schools, teachers, we'll, we'll do this training anywhere. Um, so that's a, a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, and in the first year of our project, I just wanted to share one more tidbit of something that we done. We did. Um, we had a YMSM summit. So basically, we sent out a call for applications. And to any provider in the country who is delivering services to young men of sex with men, um, they really had, though, also to be, be providing HIV care, HIV services. And so we flew everyone out to California. We had a two-day meeting, and really what the, 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 it was a wonderful meeting, and we really just talked with all these amazing providers and said, what are you doing? What's working? What are, what are you learning? What, what, you know, what are the challenges you're still having? And we, you know, wrote up the results and that actually guided the curriculum that we have. So um, it really also um, spoke to the need to using a more strength-based strength, strength -based approach to the messaging that we're doing because what, what, what I'm hearing and what a lot of people focused is, have talked about is, you know, a lot of programs historically focus on what clients are doing wrong, their risk behaviors, and not any of their strengths and assets. And um, if we kind of tailor the message a little more to be more strengths-based and highlight your strengths, here's what you can do, and here's a resource, and let me help you as opposed to what not to do, um, which obviously we also have to share, but really empowering our patients um, in this process to set goals and achieve them. Um, so more positive interventions designed at reaching goals, and this is especially true with youth, because on, um, one of our advisory board peer members, he said, we're tired of the bad news. Like, tell us something mm. good and help us do something good with our life. Um, so that's just a little bit about our project and what we've been working on, and thank you all for having me. Thank you so much, Brandy. I'm wondering if um, outside of focusing on strengths and assets, if there are like one or two other things that when you got the providers together that they said was working well and, and was helping in the interaction with their patients, if there was just one or two more things you wanted to share with the group. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Actually, you know what, let me find, I just want to make sure I don't miss any of them. Um, some of that highlights of things that they that have been working would be making the treatment you provide more enjoyable, so making it fun. For instance, having events that, um, I'm trying to think if there was a really good example. Um, for instance, if you're doing an, it's a really an HIV testing type of service you're going to provide, wrap that around something fun, like a, that involves food or 
video games or you name it, like some sort of other activity that isn't just about health. So really tying into other things to look at, like the whole person, treating the whole person, not just health. Um, creating a safe culture, so really, um, you know, folks in, our, in this community may have difficulty speaking with families and loved ones, so helping build relationships with other people, you know, having groups, help, you know, helping our patients access people in the community that, you know, bringing people together, basically. Um, also using social media, there's, you know, I'm older, so I do use Facebook, but, you know, the younger generation is using all kinds of apps and all kinds of things, so um, a lot of the different groups are actually using um, for instance, like a YouTube chat um, where they talked about PrEP and sort of making PrEP less scary or anything about it. So, and having, you know, a young man who's on PrEP who looks like you, look, looks like the patient, delivering that message and having frank discussions um, about services. Um, let's see, what else? And a huge thing that was a big theme was involving peers. So, you know, like I said, in our project, it was really tailored to the youth, but this would apply to anyone is like having members of that community in your agency involved in what you're doing. So from service delivery to your advertisement to what it is that you're doing, that having someone with the lived experience of what you're doing is critical um, because we can, you know, deliver the messages all we want, but the message isn't being heard because we're not doing it the right way. Um, and that, you know, involving peers really, really improves just the responsiveness of a patient feeling safe and wanting to come back and even come through the door really and say like, oh, okay, this is for me. Um, and then also just meeting the basic needs of the patients, like it's not just about getting HIV tested. They want person-centered, holistic care, talking about sexual health, um, food, housing issues, all kinds of things, education, you know, having maybe a job training, resume building type workshop at your center as well. So it was really, really wonderful meeting and um, there's a lot of great work going on around the country. So that's good. Lovely, thank you so much. And mm -hmm. to echo your sentiments, I see that um, Dolores has mentioned in the chat room that, you know, drop-in centers for young MSM work because they provide an environment to interact and to network with and have people uh, working in those centers usually who are reflective of the population. Um, so right. I think that's really great. Uh, you know, I'd like to kind of turn our conversation and open it up to everybody on the call. Um, and if our panelists have any ideas or questions, but to, to ask about sort of what has worked for you um, in terms of improving linkage and retention and viral load suppression for MSM of color um, as, a, as a provider. Has anyone tried, you know, this is one thing, I'm sorry to jump in, um, has anyone tried, uh, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, what Brandy was just discussing and how it fits in so nicely as a solution um, that it sounds like a lot of folks have tried for, um, you know, youth with the drop-in centers. You know, what you're doing is you're offering an opportunity to kind of meet people where they're at, to provide needed services and, and information um, in a way that is not as threatening, because uh, you're offering the other things that kind of acknowledge the personhood of the people that you're trying to, um, you know, interact with, and and actually drawing them in with with something that is fun or important to them in another way. You know, I think that you know, thinking about older gentlemen, you know, there's stuff that we can probably do for optimal health that kind of draws in, you know, folks who are in the 65 plus you know, um, range, what do we do for folks who are between the ages of like 25 and 65 though who are MSM of color? Are there drop-in centers um, or some idea that we could have or that anyone has experimented with that kind of meets folks where they're at there that address some of those um, really important communication and perception issues that, um, that both Joey and um, 
uh, Nathaniel had mentioned earlier, and that gets at some of those initial um, suggestions that Amir had made. You know, I, I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, I can't remember the last speaker name, I apologize, but she brought up a good point about some, well, she was pointing out some of the disparities, uh, discrepancies we use. And it's the same thing. If you listen to them, they're the same things that, that we all have, you know, mm -hmm. discrimination, drugs, you, you name it, the same scenario. Here in Jacksonville, I, I try to recruit people to our planning council, so I came up with the idea, some other um, community workers came up with the idea to have a youth summit to try to find out because that's the key. I think I typed that in there. And if we don't educate our youth, then we're not going to move nowhere as a, as a community. We have to educate these young people because remember, I'm 60 years old, so I got about, what, 30 more years, and I'm going to be somewhere sitting out looking crazy. So we need to educate. The key to this is educate our youth and pull our older people in there to show them experience and guide. And we have a youth drop-in center here, which is called Jasmine. Um, but it's, it's isolated. The youth are isolated. We need to interact with our youth. That is the key. We got to learn how we got to come up with some type of mechanism because they're all over social media, true enough. They've been talking about developing concepts or support groups through social media. But, but the health department is limited as how we can support them. But it's other people, I heard somebody else say, there's other people in the community that can go forward with this, private entities can go forward with this. So we need to pull, uh, first we need to focus on our youth and put up some type of educational program. They're not just helping MSMs of, of, of lesbian, transgender youth, but all our youth. All our youth need to be educated because they interact with each other. Period. We can't keep breaking down silos and barriers when we when we don't address the total issue of the community. Thank you, Ms. Daniel. You know, um, I see that Kevin in Minneapolis has talked about a young MSM um, specific clinic evening. And Kevin, I don't want to call you out on the webinar, but it just this information that you've shared sounds really interesting, so I'm wondering if you would be able to kind of talk to everybody about this specific evening clinic and um, what that looks like and the success that you, that you have had with that. And Kevin, I have unmuted your line, and um, if you want to ask your question that you had around HIPAA following um, describing your clinic, that would be awesome. Great. Um, currently, I work in California, but while well, I did work in Minnesota, um, they did have the STD HIV clinic had a specific young MSM clinic night. And it provided not only a time when the young MSM would know that that was their time and there wouldn't be older people or other, other uh, genders, races, et cetera, or not races, but genders and, and sexual orientations present. Um, it did provide also a time for the other youth serving community uh, services to come down to the clinic so while they were waiting for their STD screenings and their HIV testing, they could interact with other um, agencies that had resources for them. Um, the music was youth-centric and there was some snacks. And, uh, so the resources and peer um, environment was a very successful way to increase the attendance at the clinic by young MSM. Okay with that one? Okay, so then on to my question about HIPAA. When we try to get community-based organizations to um, collaborate and work with healthcare providers, oftentimes the healthcare providers are in systems that don't allow community-based organizations to work with them. Is it possible to um, talk about successful ways to bridge that barrier of HIPAA so that community-based organizations serving MSM of color can work with healthcare providers in the healthcare provider locale. Kevin, I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, the, in terms of sharing data, you know, at, between uh, agencies, here in Missouri, we've, we have some data sharing agreements, but it's not quite to the specificity that you've asked about 
community-based organizations uh, talking to each other and, you know, getting over that HIPAA barrier um, to talk to healthcare providers. So I'm just curious if anybody else on the call has had any experience with that or recommendations for Kevin. As a reminder, you can unmute your line by pressing the orange button to the right of your name, and it will be really interested in hearing what your thoughts are. And for folks, for folks who work with other agencies, like perhaps you're a HRSA project officer, perhaps you're a, um, an NQC coach or another, um, you know, an ATC coach, um, please feel free to unmute your line and uh, share resources as well. Looking for some of my folks from um, D.C. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know if our friends in um, Kate, I think, Kate um, Bruckman, um, I think I have unmuted your line. Is there anything that you would share from your experience in H4C, you know, in terms of putting together, you know, your statewide team in Ohio that might be, you know, kind of similar? I think a couple of the states struggled with uh, the HIPAA stuff at the very beginning. Um, I don't know if yours was one of them. I may have unmuted the wrong line. Oh, Michael? Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> We actually are still, we, we definitely had some trouble and we are still struggling. Um, so I don't really have anything to add, actually. Oh, hmm, okay. It makes me wonder, like, what we can do. Clemens, um, you know, how have we talked about this when we have, um, you know, tried to work with folks? And is there something that we can do from our standpoint? Um, you know, um, anyone who is, you know, you know, related, Chap, I don't know if you have any ideas. Um, you know, how can we, you know, help folks to share information um, in a way that kind of helps us with HIPAA? And as you're so Michael, about I, I can just talk about, this is Chef coming. Um, from the inpatient setting, that was something that was um, really guarded. Patient's privacy was highly guarded. So mm -hmm. um, just to say that even before, we, if we had any questions or doubts as to whether it was a violation or not, we had a HIPAA office that we had to go through to vet these questions and all these issues. So um, from my point of view, as coming from the inpatient setting, uh, patient information was not uh, freely Really shared outside and it's a the very organization. Rigid structural thing. Yes. How do we break down those walls, Chep? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I know here in um, Los Angeles. I know when, when we've worked with other agencies, what what we've had to do is get a, a consent from the patient to agree to share the information. So that's I mean it's an extra step, but I know yes. that's really the only way that I know we've been able to breathe and then have a, like an, I'm trying to, I'm digging through my files to find the right word. Um, an agreement was set up like between, for instance, UCLA and then whatever clinic it is. They, uh, agencies have an agreement on their relationship basically and what they can share. Um, but then at the, us as well though, because we're doing with dealing with substance use, there's an extra layer of protection and more yeah. privacy. So, you know, perhaps what I'm sharing is not as specific to everyone. You know, we have 42 CFR and other things that um, are more really it's protected what information you can share. So the patient has to agree to it. Yeah. This is Kevin, and and I believe that some of the work to lower the well. We either have to raise the bar for healthcare providers or collaborate with healthcare providers by CBOs and ASOs that have the literacy of serving mm -hmm. MSM of color. Um, and so memorandums of understanding or memorandums of agreement so that the staff of the ASOs that are advocating and working with MSM of color can be there present in their healthcare system as well or interact with the healthcare system to collaboratively work to support the health of MSM is the goal that I think that we need to work towards. And the memorandums of agreement and understanding that Grandy's referring to um, are a facilitator to help with that. 
know, maybe I can, um, you know, also help folks think about this from another perspective. Um, and Ms. Dolores, I don't want to put you too much on the spot here, but, you know, um, we talked about this last month, and I'm, I'm, going to be talking about lot, I'm going to be talking about it a lot because it's new and very exciting. And as a person living with HIV, I just am thrilled that there's a way for um, folks to kind of finally understand this and maybe tackle it a little bit. Um, the way that this works is that um, it is a international partnership that involves the International um, Committee of Women, Coalition for Women, the GNP Plus, and um, UN AIDS. So if I wanted to do this in my area, what I need to do is I need to create a coalition of consumers in my area, and I need to contact you know, that partnership, those three large international groups, and start a conversation or, with or, them. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, hi, hi. Good. So um, what you need to do in the U.S., um, the U.S. is rolling out uh, the People Living with HIV Stigma Index, and it is being managed by the U.S. People Living with HIV Caucus. And they have a website. I'm sorry I don't have the link right now, but maybe Michael can just put it up. But you just need to contact the U.S. people living with HIV caucus to let them know of your intention uh, to implement the people living with HIV uh, uh, stigma index. And they will be able to work with you in your rollout. Um, each entity that is doing the research have to provide their own resources. And so that has been one of the barriers um, because it's so difficult to get resources. But in New Jersey, where I am, we've received resources from the Department of Health. In other places, uh, they've received resources through private uh, grants um, by applying to different foundations. So there are ways to do it. Um, in New Jersey, we're doing it statewide. But you might choose to do it citywide or a specific area. So I think it's not an undaunting task. It is a task that is very possible and can be um, a, a framed based on where you are and what your needs are. And, and the reason in particular, well, this is an exciting project like I mentioned before, but the reason in particular I mentioned it is that, you know, when we're thinking about how do I find consumers to interview and what organizations might I work with if, if I wanted to do this? Um, it's an MOU process that is, you know, kind of recognizing HIPAA as well. So, like, you know, I think, is, I think that there's a number of different, um, I guess, cars in motion that are kind of on this highway. And like, I think that one of the ways that we kind of tear down those walls of, around collaboration with each other is to think about, think about this from a number of ways. You know, the TPO exclusions for, you know, a HIPAA waiver, you know, treatment payment operations. A collaboration is clearly about treatment and operations both. You know, um, there's that. But then there's um, this project. Um, there's the training project that um, Brandy was mentioning earlier, and that the more and more we kind of work together and kind of, you know, have common goals and are working towards something together, I think the more and more those um, barriers will go away because, you know, someone who is well-intentioned but, you know, kind of has their face too close to the paper and can't see the forest for the trees, you know, in terms of thinking about HIPAA, you know, all of a sudden their voice will be lessened, you know, and the organization will be more likely to join in with other organizations that are demonstrating this type of activity and that it's actually for the great, great benefit of the community, that there's no harm at all, <laughs> the great benefit of the community for, for collaboration to happen. So that's, that's the reason why I wanted to share, share this with you and, and kind of um, bring it to your attention if you didn't know about it already. Thank you, Michael. And, um, you know, kind of while we're talking about resources, I wanted to, uh, we've highlighted Brandy and her work and the stigma index, but I wanted to see if uh, Amir or Joey or Nathaniel, if you guys had any other resources as it relates to MSM of color that you wanted to share, um, and maybe that would help somebody along their journey who's listening today in working with uh, MSM of color. The only thing I have, I think I've responded to somebody because they asked um, a question um, 
in a rural area, where do they go in? You just have to meet them wherever they are. That's, that's the basic intervention. You have to meet people where they're at. So does that mean going into the clubs? Or that mean going on the street corner or wherever they hang out? We have to reach out to them. I mean, we have to reach out to them wherever they are. It's as simple as that to me. And then when you get them, then try some of those interventions, those standard interventions that we use. Use those, but you first you got to reach out to them. You got to introduce yourself. You got to develop a healthy relationship with them if you want to interact with them. Thank you, Nathaniel. Anything else to add, Joey or Amir? Looks like Michael's pulling up uh, his health website, which also has a lot of really great resources and. I just particularly struck by the imagery um, uh, on this site as well. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I, this is Joey. I don't have anything to add. Um, I think that I, with the, the last time that the that we had a meeting in Washington, the spokespersons, um, I brought it up, which was um, in some examples, which I will re-address again through an email. Um, about peer educators. That's about it. I think it's been a wonderful call. I hope it was uh, very good for everybody who was in on it. And I, I wish you all uh, a lot of success with the endeavors that we put forth. Thank you. No, I, I found I have found this call to be, you know, really inspiring. I find all these calls to be inspiring. And you know, one of the things that um some folks have mentioned before is that like I wish that there were more concrete interventions that were shared on this line, but one of the things that should be apparent, you know, through the discussion is that there's a tremendous amount of experience on this line right now. You know, um individual experience living with HIV and walking this walk, but also, you know, as a provider or a um network leader in terms of helping, you know, um folks to walk that walk. Um and making sure that providers are educated, making sure that folks are, you know, prepared to treat MSM of color, um, you know, and achieve health equity um with them. Um I think that, you know, listening to these stories helps us understand a little bit or reminds us a little bit about some of the common barriers are and to um, identify some of the common facilitators. And hopefully um, through this uh, discussion you've um, recognized that the speakers are all people that you should feel comfortable reaching out to to um, identify some um, concrete or specific concrete interventions. Um, and of course, you know, I'm here, Julia's here, um, Emily Clements is here um, at the NQC team. All of your coaches are here for those of you who have NQC coaches in the field, you know, to help you kind of sort through and to think about the um, specific concrete intervention that's going to work, but, you know, to think strategically first, before you just dive in and do, you have to understand, you know, what is the problem with um, folks in my clinic and why is there this, this disparity and to start thinking why we have a disparity first before we start trying to put something into practice, which, um, you know, as you know, with NQC, the QT term we have for that is a doo-doo cycle because it produces nothing but you know, so think about this, you know, think strategically about the populations that you serve, who you're trying to impact, how you're trying to impact them, when you're trying to impact them by, and then that will help you in the conversations you have with your coaches, uh, with your peers, and with researchers, um, you know, in terms of identifying the specific interventions. Um, that was beautifully stated, Nathaniel, thank you for that. So um, at this point in time, um, it is uh, 2.29, and I'd like, I'd like to turn it back over to um, Clemens Steinbach, our director, to provide some um, closing words for us today. Clemens. Let me unmute you, sir. You're I'm unmuted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm probably on mute. Give me one second. I gotcha. I'm sorry, sorry for that. I was just a mute not to interfere. So first of all, I wanted to um, thank all of you for participating today. Um, it was, thank you so much for sharing your stories. And um, we're particularly thankful and grateful for, for being on the call today. And I hope you take some lessons learned back to your programs. I think quality improvement is all about implementation. 
and we hope that we put some seeds in the ground for further um, exploration at your site. So thanks so much for participation. Michael? Thanks so much, Clemens. And, um, you know, on, on my behalf, thank you for joining us. And, and Julia, I don't know if you want to take us home and also express some thanks here. Uh, well, I just really wanted to say a special thank you to our speakers today. I think that, um, you know, you, everyone really illustrated some very important aspects of, of working with MSM of Color and, and the challenges and the um, just the the interconnections that we have um, among lots of different perspectives, as well as the different um, webinars that we've already had. So there are these themes that keep coming up, and it's just important to keep that dialogue open and going. Um, and I, so I just thank you, and thank you for the people who participated today. Uh, like Michael said, if you have questions, if you, ha if you want to reach out to anyone um, in regards to resources or if you're stuck trying to work on something in terms of a quality activity, um, there's a lot of expertise here, so please do reach out. We, we want to be that, um, that help and that connection for you. And if we don't have the answer, we will um, help connect you to the right person who hopefully can get you going. So thank you, everyone. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank have you a wonderful much. day. You too. Thank you. Thank you.